Calarol the Vile lies dead on the floor of the summoning chamber. Before the surviving members of the Revenant Vow can celebrate, the Black Keep begins to shake. They are five levels below ground, deep underneath the keep. As the floor beneath them shifts, as the walls around them shudder, as the ceiling above them begins to crack and splinter, the heroes realize they have only moments to escape before the entire keep collapses around them. They must carefully navigate their escape. If they fail, they will be buried here with Calarol, and the world will never hear of their deeds. Sigurd leads the party. Carefully retracing their steps backward through the maze they navigated to get here, he successfully leads the characters backward through the labyrinth, never making a wrong turn. Baltair passes a doorway on the way out. He stops and realizes that based on the geometry of the keep, it must lead to a stairway up. Follow me, he says, and opens the door. The heroes come to a T-intersection, unsure of which way to go. Nosa detects a faint breeze coming from the right. That corridor must lead to the world above. This way, she shouts. Sigurd halts and looks at the ground. He thinks he sees tracks. He's unsure. As he tries to read the ground and detect if there's a faster way out, he fails to notice the giant block of masonry about to shake loose from the ceiling and crush him. But Baltair the human monk notices it. In an instant, he pushes Sigurd out of the way, and the masonry falls on Baltair, dislocating his shoulder. But Sigurd is alive. The party skids to a stop, the corridor in front of them blocked by a giant column of stone that is broken loose and blocks their way. Baltair approaches the stone. Concentrating for a moment to gather his strength, he heaves and lifts and hurls the stone out of the way, clearing the passageway. As the heroes desperately ascend through the dungeon below the keep, as the walls around them shake and crumble and collapse, Sigurd stops and notices something strange about the wall next to him. It's a secret door with a stairway leading up, another level closer to safety. Having found shortcuts and secret doors they never used to get down here in the first place, the heroes now find themselves tantalizingly close to the surface. The shaking of the keep becomes more violent, walls and ceilings collapse around them, they are about to be crushed under the keep and buried with Calarol. Facing a four-way intersection of no obvious choice, Sigurd notices tracks leading to the right. This way, he shouts, and leads the party to the final staircase, and freedom. Standing under the sun in the daylight outside on the grass surrounding the keep, they watch as the giant monument of Calarol the Vile collapses. The scion of Orcus is dead, his keep destroyed, and the heroes safe. Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. That was a skill challenge and the way I ended the first campaign at Turtle Rock Studios. The heroes had just defeated Calarol the Vile, but I didn't want that to be the end. I thought that might be kind of anticlimactic, so I wanted to make getting out of the keep itself its own challenge. A dramatic punctuation mark at the end of the battle. So that's the topic of this week's episode. We're going to talk about skill challenges. Skill challenges are a mechanic introduced in 4th edition D&D, which I was a big fan of, both the edition and the idea of skill challenges. But they weren't super popular, they were somewhat controversial, and I think that's because, I think that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't think the designers did a super good job explaining them. I think we needed more examples of how they work. And secondly, I think they were a little undercooked. I think they needed maybe one more revision by the designers. But I immediately fell in love with them, and because I liked them so much, I worked on them and massaged the design a little bit to make it more fun and more useful, I think. Now, this whole thing came up because... Last week on Critical Role, someone in the party tried to resurrect someone else, I'm not going to say who, no spoilers, and Matt Mercer busted out something kind of sort of like a skill challenge in order to do that. And while I was watching, I thought, holy crap, a skill challenge, I love those. And we were talking about it on Twitter, and I said how much I like skill challenges, but then as I was watching, I thought, oh, wait a minute, I don't think this is actually a skill challenge. As far as I can tell, and I'm nowhere near 100% sure, when someone in Matt Mercer's game tries to resurrect somebody else, he has them roll against some really high difficulty class. And he allows the other players in the party to help that player out. Every time somebody else in the party succeeds in helping, it lowers the difficulty of that player's role. I don't even know what the role is. I think it's like persuasion or something. You're like calling out to the uh, spirit of the dead body, trying to persuade them to come back. And you start off with like a 25 DC. And every time somebody helps you with your persuasion check, the DC lowers until eventually it's something that you can reasonably do. And that is basically how Aid Other works in 3.5 or 3.0, the earlier edition of D&D, two editions ago. If you are trying to do something and it's super hard, your friends can try to help you out. And when they try to help you, they only have to beat a DC of 10. So if several people are trying to break down a door, how it actually works is you're trying to break down the door, they're trying to help you. Maybe the DC for breaking down the door is like 25 or something ridiculously high, and there's no way you can roll that on a D20. But when your friends roll, they're rolling to help you. They only have to be a DC of 10. And if they succeed, you get plus two to your roll. And with each of your friends helping and each of them contributing plus two with their own skill checks, you can get way above 20. That is what it seems like Matt Mercer is doing. But because I thought, because I started off thinking, oh, this is a skill challenge. And we were talking about it on Twitter, a bunch of people on Twitter were like, what's a skill challenge? And I said, well, let me tell you. I love skill challenges because they're a great opportunity to take something like a montage scene from a movie, something maybe like a chase sequence or something where we know how it would work in our minds. We have a very clear idea how this would work, but there's no obvious mechanic to do it in D&D or that mechanic would be super tedious. 
like trying to get out of the black keep as it collapses. I could literally have had the players trace their way back and go movement by movement and say, okay, well, in 10 rounds, the keep collapses. Which way do you guys go? Show me on your map and then block it out with their minis on the grid. But that would have been super tedious and boring and I don't think very exciting. But I could certainly imagine the idea if this were a movie, I could imagine the idea of the heroes desperately trying to figure out which way are we supposed to go as the keep collapses around them. That's what a skill check is for, a moonlight chase across the rooftops. What is the actual mechanic? Isn't it just, I move five squares and then I move five more squares? Have I caught up to this guy? Right, Dungeons and Dragons tactical combat isn't designed to model that. But skill challenges let you model like almost anything. And also fundamental to the idea of a skill challenge is that the entire group participates. Everyone's making skill checks, not just one player. If one person is trying to desperately lift this heavy thing, I would say, yeah, okay, the rest of you can help, and I would probably use the same rules Matt uses for that, the aid other stuff from 3.0. Let's continue using the example of the Black Keep, and I will explain how I did that as a skill challenge. Skill challenges track successes versus failures. Regardless of how difficult the skill challenge is, if you accumulate three failures, the group fails. In this instance, it would mean the party fails to escape the Black Keep, and they are crushed underneath it. Now, since this is a group thing, I could have said if the party accumulates three failures, they're all crushed underneath the Black Keep, but that's not much fun. So what I wrote in my notes was that if the group fails, every person in the party has to make either an athletics check or an acrobatics check to see if they can successfully get out of the keep at the last second. Everyone who fails is trapped and crushed. So that was a possibility that people could die even though no one had hit them in combat, no one had cast a spell at them, they still had all their hit points. Because I think we can agree, regardless of how many hit points you have, if a keep collapses on you, you're dead. It was dramatic and it made sense in context. Nobody balked at that. Now, as a footnote, I've used this same skill challenge again when the party was trying to escape Bedegar Keep in the other campaign. They had been led deep into Bedegar Keep by the Black Rose, and once they realized they had been betrayed, they tried to escape. Bedegar Keep wasn't collapsing around them, so there was no chance they were all going to die if they failed to get out. But what I did was I said, every failure you accumulate means there are more guards at the exit trying to stop you when you escape, and that was a combat encounter. So there was a combat encounter, the heroes versus the guards, and the input of that encounter was how many failures did you accumulate during the skill challenge? And there was a maximum. If they failed three times, then they got like 12 guards or something. So that's how failure works. The group always fails if they accumulate three failures on their skill checks. Doesn't matter how complex the skill check is, if you accumulate three failures, you have failed the test. So the difficulty comes in how many successes you need. A simple skill challenge, you only need three successes before you accumulate three failures. A difficult skill challenge might be like six or nine. It's up to you, it doesn't have to be units of three, it could be whatever you want. So that's how a skill challenge works. The group, the party collectively, has to accumulate a certain number of successes, in our example six, before they accumulate three failures. It's always three failures. So how do you get successes and failures? You make skill checks. First of all, whenever I do this, I always make sure the players know they are in a skill test. This is something that I think other DMs didn't do when fourth edition came out. They wanted it to feel more natural and less gamey, and so they would often introduce this mechanic kind of without describing it explicitly. And I think that frustrated some players. But I always say, okay, this is a skill challenge, and I tell the players how many successes they need to accumulate before they get three failures. I want to add that I've done this several times, and in every instance, the players were super into it. They like knowing that they're in a mini game, and they like knowing what the conditions of the test are. I always begin a skill challenge by giving the players a list of two or three skills that I tell them these will absolutely work. And the reason I do that is because it gives them an idea, it gets the juices flowing, it gives them an idea of how are we going to get out of here, what are the different ways we can use. I'll say something like, you can use survival, which is tracking to retrace your steps and find your way back out of the keep. Right, like it took them hours and maybe the better part of a day to find their way down to the fifth level of the dungeon and they rested several times and in an emergency while the keep is collapsing around them, they might not be able to remember exactly how did we come down here, that's what survival's for. So I tell the players survival is useful, you can retrace your steps. I tell the players insight will help you find a shortcut and I tell the players they can use investigation to find hidden or secret ways out of here. So that's three obvious skills and then it's up to them to try other stuff. And you can do crazy things with successes. Like for instance, what I said when they were trying to escape the Black Keep was that the DC for survival was 13. So if a player made a survival check and rolled a 13 or better, they accumulated one success out of the six they needed because they were successfully able to remember how did we get down here? Was it left or right? Did we go through that door or this door? And I also decided, and I don't think I told the players this, I just wrote it down, that if the survival check result was 18 or higher, they accumulated two successes. They found a shortcut. 
So obviously characters with high insight, with high survival, they were able to make checks. They were able to get the players a certain percentage of the way out. They got some of these six successes that they needed, but they couldn't get all of them. And so that meant the other players had to be creative. That was when Anna playing Nosa the Human Barbarian said, um, is there a way I can use nature? She's looking at her character sheet and she says, well, I'm trained in nature. And she asks me, can I use nature to get us out of here? I, now I did not say, yeah, sure, go for it. I asked her to describe to me how she would use nature to do this, right? The goal here is to get the players is thinking creatively about how to use their skills. It's like role-playing your skills. It's a lot of fun. And that's when Anna, remembering Gandalf in the Mines of Moria, said, well, could I use my nature uh, skill to detect like which way the air currents are flowing? And I thought that was brilliant. That is a great use. I didn't tell her that nature was legal. That wasn't on the original list. It was up to her to figure it out. Tom, seeing how Anna did that, looked at his athletics check and said, uh, is there a way for me to use athletics to like push a fallen boulder aside so that we can make it through an otherwise blocked off exit? And I said, go ahead and make an athletics check. And he made it and he succeeded. And I described Baltair with his massive muscles. He's like Hercules, basically. I think he's got a 20 strength lifting up this giant piece of masonry that had fallen and blocked their way out. One of the two ways I modified skill challenges to make them, I think, in my at least in my opinion, a little bit more robust was first, I said, you have to be trained in the skill to attempt it. This is a house rule of mine I use even outside skill challenges. I'll tell players that they can only make a test if they are proficient in that skill. And the situation I'm trying to avoid is one where a character who we all agree obviously should not be good at this, just happens to roll a 20, but the character who does this all the time and is our local expert fails at it because he rolled a one. That is profoundly unsatisfying. And it's easy to, you know, explain away why can't the warrior gladiator who's been in the slave pens for the last 10 years just happen to know this obscure bit of our Arcana, yeah, you can do that, but does that make the wizard player feel special and feel like a wizard? If you have a small party, like you're playing with two or three characters, that kind of stuff's not that big a deal because if you call for a perception check, for instance, there aren't that many people making an attempt. It's not that likely that someone in the group is going to roll a 20, but I, I'm often running for six or seven people. And so for me, it's important to protect the people who are good at something from the people who are just rolling randomly. And when you've got seven players sitting around the table, there's a good chance one of them's going to roll a 20. So I often tell players, you can only make an attempt at this skill if you're proficient in it. I'm just trying to make proficiencies more meaningful. So in skill challenges, you can only make an attempt if you're proficient at the skill. And once you make an attempt with one skill, you can't try again with that skill. You can try with other skills and other characters can try that skill, but you can't, that was your shot. And the reason I do that is because if I don't limit the number of successes you can accumulate from one skill per character, then the best character at something just goes success, 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 and wins. And then it doesn't feel like the group is doing it. So like, for instance, the moonlight chase across the rooftops, I might say you can use your acrobatics to leap across one of the gaps between the buildings and the thief character with the ridiculously high acrobatics just goes, oh, I'll just do that six times. And that's boring. It's not fun to watch. and It doesn't make the group feel like they're all working together. So you have to be trained in the skill, and once you've tried one skill, you can't try that skill again. Other players can try it, and you can try other skills, but that was your shot. In each instance, it's up to you, the dungeon master, to describe to the players how their skill earns them a success. And I often write these things down ahead of time. I have a whole list of each skill, including the ones I haven't told the players. Like I already knew that it was possible for someone to use their athletics or it was possible for someone to use nature to find the, uh, the, the air currents that would lead them to freedom. But I don't wanna give the players all the answers. I want it to be part of their creativity. That's part of your job as a dungeon master is to describe to the players how each of their skill checks earns them a success in a dramatic way. One thing it's important to do is write down what are the consequences of failure? Write down what happens if they fail one skill test and then what happens if they fail the entire challenge? In this instance, failing the entire challenge meant there was a chance they could all get crushed underneath the collapsing black keep. But I also pointed out that if they failed any skill challenge, it meant that while they were standing around thinking about what the right way to go was, or is there a secret door there? Or is there a shortcut here? A giant block of masonry in the collapsing keep falls on them and does 3d6 damage. So that was the consequence of failing any of these skill tests. But because lives were on the line, right? If they accumulate too many failures, they're not gonna be able to get out of here. I wanted to make sure there was a way for them to undo failures. In fact, I came up with two ways. The first was acrobatics. The player is trying to use their skill inside or nature or whatever to try to find a way out and they fail, which means they're standing around for a couple seconds and they don't notice this giant block of stone about to drop on them. And then they look up and they go, oh my goodness. And they make an acrobatics check to avoid getting crushed and taking 3d6 damage. The other way was perception. Another character could make a perception check when you failed and push you out of the way. And then they took the 3d6 instead of you. 
And that happened. Sigurd had insight trained, but he doesn't have really high wisdom, and he failed his role, which meant he was standing around looking through the dungeon trying to figure out how do we get out of here when a giant stone block was about to fall down. I said, Tom, make a perception check. Tom made a perception check and rolled really well. He noticed the block about to fall, and he pushed Sigurd out of the way, Lars's character, and then Baltair, Tom's character, took the 3d6. Super dramatic. So you can tell this is really dynamic. There are lots of ways to accumulate successes. There are actually ways to undo failures. Some of those ways to undo failures completely negate the failure, like making a successful acrobatics check. Some of them just mitigate the damage if you make a successful perception check instead of Sigurd taking the damage, Baltair took it. So that's one skill challenge I used. I used that same skill challenge when a different group was trying to escape Bedegar Keep. We talked about that earlier. In that instance, there's going to be an encounter at the end of the skill challenge, and the number of failures you accumulate determines how nasty the encounter is. I used another skill challenge in that same battle with Calarol the Vile in the first campaign because before he was dead, he was trying to use this giant black portal to summon Orcus. And the players had to use a skill challenge to stop the ritual. This was a really difficult challenge. They had to accumulate eight successes before they got three failures. And I told them they could use Arcana and Religion because it was a portal to hell, which involves demons and that's religion. And it was a summoning portal and that's Arcana, that's magic. So Arcana and Religion made perfect sense. But I also described the portal as draining the life essence of these other characters that had been sacrificed to power it. And when I did that, one of the players said, well, can we fight it with our own healing energy? And I'm like, how would you do that? And they said, can we make a, a medicine check to burn a hit die? Now, that player came up with that idea, but I thought, that is super cool. Yeah, there's a skill test involved. It's not automatic. And if you succeed, there is some price to be paid. You have to mark off a hit die. But then you channel your own life essence into the portal, holding it at bay, stopping the evil from spreading. Now, the players had heard and believed that Calarola Vile was trying to summon Orcus. But I thought, if they summon Orcus, that's like the end of the world, basically. So I also had an NPC say, well, he can't summon Orcus. He's just a mortal. But whatever comes through there is going to be super bad. And I picked a death knight. So I wrote down in my notes that if they accumulate three failures, they summon Lord Soth. Lord Soth is a famous death knight from Dragonlance that these players have never heard of, but it's a cool name. I love stealing names that are super cool from existing things, but that maybe are now considered kind of cheesy if you read those books when you were a kid, but these players have never read those books and they'd be like, wow, Lord Soth, that guy's badass. I suspect you guys are going to have lots of questions about how skill challenges work because, again, it is this somewhat deliberately nebulous thing because it's an attempt to capture a dramatic action sequence and boil it down into a number of skill rolls. But to go over the basics, you are trying to accumulate a number of successes on skill tests before you accumulate three failures. The more successes you have to accumulate, the harder the skill challenge is. I, the dungeon master, tell the players which skills will be useful in the skill challenge, and then I leave it to them. I invite them to come up with inventive ways to use their other skills to contribute. I tell them they have to be proficient in the skill when they're making an attempt, which makes characters who are proficient feel special. And I tell them that once they have made an attempt with one skill, that player cannot attempt that skill again. Another player can attempt that same skill, and that player can attempt a different skill. In one game I ran, the players were trying to stop this giant kind of Godzilla monster demon thing. That was in another version of the same campaign I run where the players just never fought Calarol the Vile, and as a result, they never got to that point, and as a result, he completed his summoning, and this giant monster, this giant, like, 60-foot-tall demon comes out of the portal. Basically like the Tarrasque, but not exactly the same, not as powerful as this thing. They were trying to delay this giant monster from reaching a town before their high-level good guy allies could arrive to destroy this thing. They didn't have to defeat this monster. They weren't high enough level to do that. All they had to do was slow it down. So that was a cool way to allow some low-level characters who would never have a chance to stop this thing from contributing to its downfall. You can use a skill challenge to do a moonlight chase across the rooftops. Super dramatic. This bad guy is getting away. He's trying to escape. Maybe he knows something. Maybe he's going to go do something awful. The heroes have to stop him. Each success they earn gets them a little bit closer to this guy. And each failure means the guy gets farther away. And if they get three failures, that means he successfully escapes. All right, if you were doing this tactically on a grid, it would be super boring to just constantly be moving six squares, five squares. But doing it narratively, doing it inside a skill challenge means it's super dramatic. You can call for acrobatics tests. Players who succeed are able to leap across the gap between the buildings. You could call for an athletics check, and a success means a character leaps across a gap between the buildings that no acrobat could do, and he ends up hanging on by his fingernails, and he has to pull himself up in order to continue running. Again, you could use insight, and one of the characters realizes there's a shortcut. Maybe one character uses intimidation and shouts some blood-curdling oath at the fleeing bad guy, causing him to look over his shoulder and lose a few precious seconds. You see how there can be lots of inventive ways to utilize your skills in a skill challenge. Now, that doesn't mean you can use any skill. If you, the DM, can't think of a plausible, reasonable way for a character to use a skill, and they haven't offered a useful example, then I am I often say, nope, you can't do that. Right? Like, how would an arcana check help catch someone running across the rooftops? I don't know. 
Now, you in the comments may be able to come up with a great example of how you could use Arcana to catch a fleeing bandit, but uh, my point is that if you, the DM, can't think of a good way to do it at the table, and the player doesn't offer a good way, they haven't used their imagination and come up with a creative way to utilize their proficiency in Arcana for this, then just say, nope, you can't do it. Saying no judiciously, not too often, but saying no occasionally makes the characters that can do things uh, feel special. And then I think it's just important to use skill challenges every once in a while and vary them up so it's not only the characters with good physical skills that are the ones that can catch the bandit, it's also the characters with great arcana and religion and knowledge skills that can stop the ritual. It's not important that every character be able to participate in every skill challenge. It's only important that there are enough skill challenges that eventually, uh, you know, it'll all come out in the watch, eventually over the course of the campaign, each character feels like there was a moment they got to shine during a skill challenge. Otherwise, if every time you do a skill challenge it's a physical challenge then the characters that are wizards and clerics and stuff like that are going to feel cheated they're going to feel like when, when's my turn to shine that's the skill challenge episode folks it's a mechanic from fourth edition DD that i quite like and over the years i have noticed what about them frustrated the players and i just tweaked the mechanic until now when i use it even with new players they are super excited they really like the idea i asked everybody on twitter today earlier uh, which video you folks wanted did you guys want the skill challenge video next or did you guys want to talk more about npcs there were a couple of subjects i didn't cover last time in the last video i didn't cover dm pcs what happens when the dm ends up running a character in the party Party. I also didn't cover how to use high-level NPCs well. I think that's a very tricky thing. When is it appropriate for the local high-level uh, NPCs to come to the hero's rescue? How much should the heroes, if at all, rely on their high-level NPC allies? Should the heroes have high-level NPC allies? And the vote was even. It was literally 50-50 when I went to make this video, so I chose. But that's one of the advantages. If you follow me on Twitter, uh, at Matt Colville, that means you get to participate in these polls. You also get a lot of links to like cat videos and movie stuff and jokes. I'm actually on Twitter quite a lot. It's one of the side effects of sitting in front of a computer all day for a living. Next video, I think we're going to talk more about NPCs. We'll cover DM PCs and how to use high-level NPCs. But who knows, I may get struck with a flash of insight over the course of the week, or maybe there'll be something on the Idea Informer. There's a link to that in the doobly-doo where you can come by and give me your ideas for videos. That's where the idea for the NPC video came from. We're still gonna talk about campaign settings. I wanna do a whole series on those. And I suggested a little while ago that we talk about adventures that I have run and that I have liked, and we can talk about each adventure in a different episode and what I did to them, how I tweaked them to make them fun to run, and that way you can run them and learn from my mistakes. And people really seem to like that idea, so who knows what's next. As always, there are no ads in front of my D&D videos. I do not have a Patreon. If you wanna help support the channel, I encourage you to come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. Uh, check out the reviews for my novels. Uh, I just got my one. 100th review for Priest, my first book, and it was super positive, made me very happy. I don't know if that's a meaningful milestone, but it was just neat to get to 100 reviews. I've got two books up there. Each book costs four bucks, uh, of which I get three bucks. There's also a print version, but the print version is ridiculously expensive. It's like $14, of which I see $1. So it's a bad deal for you, and it's a bad deal for me. But a lot of people said they wanted the book in print, and there was a way to do that, so I gave it a shot. We didn't play D&D last week, so there was no campaign diary, but it is my hope to play this week, so there should be a campaign diary this week. And then the next Running the Game video is up to you. What do you want to see? Until then, peace out.